Good morning. Uh, yep, like Steve said, I'm Seth Walker. You can find me on Twitter, at Seth Walker. Uh, these slides are also available on sethwalker.me slash talks slash continuous hyphen experimentation. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, it's my privilege to lead a few teams at Etsy that focus on performance and front-end infrastructure. Uh, you may have seen Lara's keynote earlier today. Jonathan gave a talk yesterday. Uh, Allison is here as well. So if you want to talk to any of us about what performance at Etsy is like, uh, what the teams do, uh, the kind of work we're into, uh, we're all around and we're really happy to talk about that stuff. So come find us anytime. Uh, if you're not familiar with Etsy itself, it's a marketplace for handmade, uh, custom, unique items. Uh, it's a fantastic product. I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. This shirt features a dinosaur battling a robot. Uh, it's in the marketplace. We have over a million active sellers, over 25 million active listings. We did over a billion dollars in sales through the marketplace last year. So it's not a small site. Uh, we definitely have gone through our share of scaling challenges uh, on the technology side, having to accommodate uh, increasing amounts of traffic. Uh, we've given a few talks about that kind of stuff, but today I want to talk about uh, a different kind of scaling challenge that we're hitting these days. In the last year, we had 225 people make commits to the Etsy web code base. That includes uh, the mobile web and desktop web. That does not include native or infrastructure. Uh, and of those folks, 150 touched CSS and JavaScript. We tend to be a pretty full stack friendly shop, uh, or at least encourage everyone, enable everyone to touch the CSS and JavaScript if they're so inclined. Uh, designers as well tend to do their prototyping in HTML and CSS, uh, very, uh, feel very comfortable deploying changes to the production code base. Uh, these are some graphs showing the rates of growth of our CSS and JavaScript code base over the last year. Uh, pretty steady growth. Uh, the numbers at the bottom, which you might not be able to read, uh, we added over 1,000 lines of JavaScript in the last year uh, and 200,000 lines of code. Uh, similarly, on the CSS side, another 100,000 lines of CSS. So this is providing a lot of surface area that we have to consider when we're making changes to the Etsy code base on the front end, uh, especially if you're, say, the performance team or a front end infrastructure team, and you want to make a change that cuts across the entire code base. Let's say you're upgrading a shared library, replacing a pattern across the board. For example, we replaced um, our, we had blocking JavaScript in the head, and we wanted to move it to the foot, but we wanted to do so safely, uh, and, but also across the board and uh, without making any changes. So how would we have confidence that, we want, that we're going to make these sweeping changes uh, without being destructive or interrupt the user experience? Uh, we had to come up with some techniques for making these changes in a safe way. And luckily, uh, maybe, maybe many of you are operations-focused folks, or you've come to Velocity before, or anyway, it's our privilege to work with some really talented operations folks at Etsy, and so we borrowed some techniques from them that we've used uh, consistently on the back end to provide confidence that our, the changes we're making are uh, stable and not disruptive. One I want to talk about really briefly is feature flags. You may already be familiar with this technique. Uh, feature flags are a way to branch in code to be able to run uh, two simultaneous uh, versions of code depending on what uh, state the visitor is in. So uh, this is an example where we're going to start to introduce a new system on the back end. And it's, we're going to start writing to this system where we haven't previously done that before. And so uh, we know that you know, we've, we're systems architects. We've done a lot of planning up front. We have a complete understanding of the whole system, and we know that nothing could possibly go wrong. But also, we're systems architects, and we know that we can't possibly know everything, and that something will definitely go wrong. And so we give ourselves extra confidence that this change is not going to uh, create too much havoc by uh, putting only slightly increasing amounts of traffic on it, and then observing the uh, results on perhaps some graphs. So in this example, on the left, we're seeing, say, writes per second to this backend system, and on the left, is the response time uh, for that same system. And so to start with, we would only deploy to production for uh, people who work at Etsy uh, and validate in production that this code is working as we would expect. Then we start to put increasing amounts of traffic on it and observe the results on these systems. So 
as we would expect, the writes per second go up, and the response times stay level at 1%. So we feel confident that we can ramp up to 5%. And here we observe something that we didn't expect. Uh, the writes per second go up, as we would expect, but the response time is also shooting up. So then we can ramp back down, correlate these graphs with any other graphs we have, comb through logs, any other instrumentation of the system that could provide some answers as to where the bottleneck was. And once we have confidence that we've eliminated that bottleneck, we can continue on and ramp up. And uh, everything is pretty happy, copacetic. So that's cool, back-end systems, uh, using feature flags to kind of uh, isolate these systems and prevent them from uh, being overloaded, uh, observe these complexities in action. On the front end, uh, we have a similar need to um, make these changes safely, uh, but it's, it's different. It's not, we're not trying to protect a system from load as much. Uh, so we need some other metric to look at to identify when uh, this change is being made, and it's causing some problems. So this example, like I said earlier, we are uh, upgrading some shared library. So let's say jQuery on the front end. And in this case, the graph that we want to look at is JavaScript errors. So we have a bit of code in the browser that captures JavaScript errors and beacons it back to some central location where we can roll it up and uh, graph it. And we're plotting the current rate of errors against the historical rate. And uh, as in the previous slides, these red uh, vertical lines indicate deploys. So again, I would roll out this change where for staff only at Etsy, we see an upgraded jQuery library. Uh, for all the other civilians, they see the old branch. Uh, and at this point, I'd probably send out an email to the entire team and say, hey, I just upgraded jQuery for you all uh, in production even. So if you see any jQuery-related errors, please just let me know. Uh, and once we've kind of let that bake for a while and validate that that change is correct, we can roll it up to some uh, larger percent of users. And here again, we're not trying to isolate some backend system. We're not trying to prevent um, weird interaction effects or to observe the load on the backend system. We're just trying to flush out errors, actually, uh, to detect where we might have missed this thing. Because uh, it would be, you know, for 200,000 lines of JavaScript to go through and audit every one to validate that an upgrade, uh, you know, a, a minor version upgrade of jQuery would be successful, would be uh, onerous for one, but also likely to miss a lot of stuff. So this is a better way to, um, to validate these changes are happening as we would expect. And now we could do something like ramp up to 50% and see that the graph spikes. Uh, again, this is not, we're not going to get 100% confidence that we're correlating uh, this change to the effect. It's pretty, like, it looks right. The, the vertical bar, the graph shoots up, we use our eyeballs. We feel pretty good that we are the cause of this change. Um, and another thing we might be doing if we're at Etsy is correlating these graphs with some log messages. So if you're doing a deploy at Etsy, you're looking at a system called SuperGrep, which is just a log tailor in the browser. It aggregates all of the error logs across the whole system. In this case, I'm scoping it to only the errors that are coming from JavaScript. Uh, we can also see uh, the green bars denote uh, deploy. So again, just kind of using our gut and our eyeballs, we could maybe get a feel for if there's an increase in rate of errors uh, correlated with the deploy that we just pushed out. Uh, maybe also we could read the log messages and feel with our guts that they are related to some jQuery change. There's also these unique identifiers in the log message. And these unique identifiers are the same unique identifiers in the access logs for the request that was served. So that'll become handy later on. So again, we'll just like use our, use our eyes and get a sense, um, maybe go out and uh, fix any errors that we detected so that when we have confidence again that um, this change is successful, we can roll it up again. Using those uh, unique identifiers that I talked about, we could go one step further and join up the access log and the error log on the unique ID. And we know that uh, we ramped up to 50%, or say at this point it's a uh, 5% ramp up. So we know what we would expect the count to be. If it was a 50% ramp up, we'd, see, we'd expect equal errors across both sides of this ramp up. But because the uh, on bucket is seeing a much higher uh, rate of errors, then we can directly correlate. Then we know for sure that it was us ramping up this jQuery upgrade that introduced the errors and that there's a problem with that. So then we go fix, our, fix the problems, 
Now we can ramp up with confidence at 50%. We don't see these errors, and we can just go straight to 100%. So it's pretty sweet. That is uh, a much saner, uh, confidence-inspiring uh, method of upgrading some sort of front-end shared library than it would be uh, having to maybe comb through code and read through change logs, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, but the real party is when you go through and delete the old code and move on, because that is now the new feature of that code. So that's cool. That is using feature flags to branch on which scripts are included uh, in the application. We can even push those feature flags, leave it a little bit further into the JavaScript. At the top of every page on Etsy, there's a bit of configuration that displays which, uh, that indicates which uh, experiments are on for the given user. And then further into the scripts, either externally loaded scripts or inline scripts in the page, we can branch on that value and decide to provide one experience or the other. Uh, we're on the verge of pushing this even a little bit further and doing fully separate asset compilation uh, pipeline feature flags so that we could, say, have one fully instrumented build that has uh, maybe wraps every function call and some timing information and aggregates all that and beacons it back to the central location where we can roll it all up and uh, get timing information to identify any hotspots in JavaScript performance, or even just to detect whether these functions are being called at all so that we can go back and clean up any uh, bits of code that seem to be unused. If it, you saw the Ignite talk by the box.net folks on Tuesday, they did a similar sort of uh, instrumentation using tombstones to indicate that a function might be uh, unused or used. And I'm, I think we're at the point where we will be close to adding that information in, in an automated fashion on deploys and then being able to give it to serve a debug build to staff or maybe even a small percent of civilians uh, to get this sort of information. So that's great, feature flags. Uh, but it was really uh, when we added our, when we upped our capabilities on the analytics side that it really got interesting. So using feature flags to show one version of code to visitors uh, versus the old code to other visitors to verify and validate that the code is working operationally, as you would expect, is not dissimilar from showing one version of the code to some visitors and another version of the code to other visitors to see the impact on business. And what I'm describing here is A-B testing. Uh, but uh, at Etsy, as we developed our capabilities on analytics and uh, given that we were already comfortable with this feature flag system and rolling out small changes to validate them in production, uh, we now find ourselves in a situation that we're calling continuous experimentation. There's a talk uh, linked to from my resources page by a former principal engineer at Etsy, Dan McKinley, uh, where he describes what he means by continuous experimentation. And to paraphrase, it's small measurable changes that we deploy frequently to validate hypotheses. Uh, and just as often, we're invalidating hypotheses. So uh, instead of doing one grand change and comparing one grand change to another, uh, to the previous iteration, we'll make uh, hypotheses about user behavior and test them small, slow, and then uh, iterate on what we learn. So every uh, successful experiment will just generate a whole new suite of experiments based on what we've learned. And this is all uh, supported by tooling. We have an internal tool called Catapult that is our kind of self-service analytics uh, framework for launching and running and analyzing experiments. There's another talk by Will Stuckey at Etsy, uh, also linked to from my resources page that describes Catapult. Uh, and so just to give a, a quick run through of this, we would see, you know, I have launched an experiment and then I want to check the results. And looking at the results here, I could see that uh, the highlighted results are statistically significant and show uh, an increase in the number of pages per visit and a decrease in bounces. So I'd feel pretty good about this experiment being a success. Uh, so given that this is a tool that everyone uses and we use very frequently, uh, if you remember back, I was talking about using our eyeballs to judge whether the JavaScript error rate had gone up or down as a result of a change. Uh, it seemed only logical to add that into this tool as well. So now we're adding operational metrics to this launch tool. Uh, as you roll out experiments, if uh, you see that your side of the experiment is statistically significantly 
increasing the rate of errors, then you might be able to attribute that to the also uh, the decrease in conversion rate that you're seeing as well. Uh, we on the performance team love this tool as well. We roll out uh, plenty of performance experiments to validate that the changes that we're making are uh, doing what we would expect. So we would have a hypothesis that says faster is better. Uh, and many times we validated that hypothesis. We rolled out a uh, performance test to um, see the results of progressive JPEGs. We rolled out a performance test to um, about moving JavaScript to the bottom of the page to, uh, for, to, so it would prevent render blocking. And when we did that, we rolled it out on one page to begin with, just move JavaScript to the bottom of the page to validate the performance results um, and the business results. And seeing that they were positive, then we were uh, confident that we could do that across the board. We've also had surprising results. This was the result of an experiment we ran prefetching static assets. So our hypothesis was if you're on the search page, you're likely to click through to a listing page. And if you're clicking through to a listing page and you have the listing page static assets in your cache, it'll be a lot faster and that will be a better experience. And so we implemented that using a technique using uh, object, uh, dynamically inserted object tags to begin fetching the resources. But something about that implementation uh, was uh, causing a subpar user experience. And we wouldn't have detected that using just the performance tooling that we had. We used, uh, you know, we checked our RUM uh, results, we used web page tests, and everything said that it was faster. And yet, this experience was uh, negatively impacting the user experience. So uh, after learning that you, through this tool, we turned it off, did a bit of investigation, uh, discovered that something about this object tag implementation, perhaps uh, in coordination with other libraries that were on the page, uh, was causing some jank. Uh, the scrolling was really uh, rough when the browser was downloading these assets. And so we've since gone on to try it again using link rel equals prefetch, which is not supported in all the browsers, but it at least um, seems to be not causing a negative user experience. Uh, we don't have the results of that experiment yet, at least not statistically significant, but I can say that they're looking a lot better than this one was. So it's a really uh, validating experience to um, use this data to trust that we're making correct changes with respect to performance. So uh, that is to say, we all love this uh, situation that we find ourselves in. The ease in which we can develop uh, and uh, roll out experiments is, uh, everyone is pretty satisfied with that. The infrastructure teams, the feature teams, the product teams, uh, we have a lot of ongoing experiments it's changed the way that we build product. Uh, we recently did a redesign of our listing page, and even for this redesign, where we were going to reimagine the whole page, uh, we took this approach of doing small iterative changes uh, in order to validate hypotheses about what the behavior was going to be like. So started with one and changed things slightly to learn what each change meant when it came to the user experience. So this is a really exciting way to do product development, but there's uh, some interesting side effects as well. So for all of the ongoing experiments that we have that we're learning something, we have some number of inactive experiments. Either they are successful and they've been ramped up to 100%, or they are unsuccessful and they're ramped down to 0%. For example, 14 iterations on a listing page redesign, there's only one that's in production right now. So that's 13 code paths, experiment code paths that are that need to be cleaned up over time. Uh, these are code paths uh, that are no longer serving a valid production need. And we have a colloquial term in the industry for code that is no longer serving a purpose. That is cruft. And cruft is bad, especially on the front end, which is where we're, most of these experiments are happening. Uh, cruft in your CSS and JavaScript is unnecessary bytes that you're sending over the wire can bloat your requests. It can create unnecessary execution in the browser. Uh, I think an even bigger, uh, I'm going to even call it a performance problem here, is the cognitive overhead required to understand uh, all of this large code base when parts of it are uh, no longer necessary. So let's say I am a front end engineer and I come across something like this. And this is not the only way to uh, create these 
branches, uh, but it is probably the easiest way to just do a separate script include. And I have to say, okay, well, these are multiple requests. This is no good. We should try to roll these together if possible. Uh, maybe they're all at 100%. We can roll them together. Or maybe they're all at 0%. We can just delete them. But there's no way to know for sure without by looking just here. You have to at least look in one another place to get an understanding of what the situation is. Uh, even then, uh, there's, so JavaScript is like, there's, there's at least more we can do here. We can, we can execute code, so we can put logging statements in the JavaScript, these tombstones, as Box, uh, as Box calls them, to give ourselves some confidence that this code is either running or not. Um, but CSS doesn't have that same property. It's, uh, it does not execute code. It cannot call logging, line, logging statements. Uh, and by its nature, because of the cascade, uh, it's likely that some of these following uh, CSS uh, style sheets are overriding rules in the previous ones. Uh, it's a big, uh, it can get pretty crufty pretty quick. So let's clean it up. I love deleting code. Who here loves deleting, deleting code? Yeah, everyone. There's, there's a whole club of folks at Etsy who are, you know, their goals is to be net negative on, uh, lines of code contributed like week over week. So um, people want this. They want, they want to have this happen. But when you encounter uh, this level of complexity, this level of uncertainty about what the impact of your change will be, you're going to encounter fear. And rightly so. Uh, we had an outage two years ago at Etsy for an hour because someone deleted some CSS. And I will love to talk about that over beer sometimes, so come find me. But the point is that it's uh, not unreasonable to have take the position that this code is running in production now. It's not hurting anything except maybe small performance overhead or small cognitive load overhead, but it's not worth my time to go make certain that this code is not going to blow something up if I delete it. People want to throw this stuff away, but they don't have a lot of confidence in their ability to throw this stuff away. It's a great blog post by Bill Scott of PayPal, He's currently at, or he was previously at Netflix, uh, and he talked about how the front end is the experimentation layer and how they were seeing 90% of their front end code thrown away uh, within a year or something like that. And that for uh, what he was observing was that it was necessary for them to start to accommodate that workflow and to design for throwaway ability. Uh, and my understanding is that it, that includes some amount of uh, structuring your code in a way to make it easier to throw away, uh, perhaps even accommodating some amount of copy and pasting uh, to, to reduce dependency on some shared libraries that you know are ephemeral in nature anyway. We have not been approaching uh, throwaway ability in the same way at Etsy. We reached for one of our uh, favorite tools, that is tools. Uh, and so looking at the problem, what we decided was that we needed more visibility into uh, the nature of the dependencies. Uh, if you're making a change to something that could impact other things, how do you know what those things are? What is the interconnectedness of all the things? So we built a tool that we're calling Ranger to expose these dependencies. Uh, in this example, I'm looking at a JavaScript module, uh, and it uh, shows some uh, com code complexity uh, metrics, uh, recent commits, but then also what pages this JavaScript is being shown on. And all of that's being generated through instrumentation. So we have uh, logging in our application code whenever we serve some JavaScript. Uh, and then also we can use the static analysis from our asset pipeline, our asset compilation, to see what the module dependencies are as well. And then clicking through to an HTML endpoint, we can see what CSS and what JavaScript is loaded on this page. Going through to CSS, we can see what selectors are defined in this style sheet and what are imported. Uh, where it uh, shows up, what HTML endpoints it shows up on, uh, and also the dependency graph using import statements of the CSS. And to bounce back up quickly here, I want to highlight the section on the CSS about unused selectors. So again, giving people confidence that uh, they can make changes that uh, are safe, that reduce cruft. I think 
unused selectors in CSS is kind of the holy grail of cruft cleanup on the front end. And there exist plenty of tools that allow you to do this using static analysis. You just you know, point one of these tools at a URL, and it grabs the HTML, and it grabs the CSS, and it tries to identify which selectors are unused. So if you remember that we're running all of these experiments, there's also, in addition to the experiments, there's a many number of states that a visitor could be in. So they could be a buyer on Etsy or a seller. They could be signed in. They could be signed out, uh, in addition to being bucketed into all of these experiments. And that just makes, it explodes the complexity of all of the places that you would have to uh, target for static analysis to identify unused selectors. So how did we generate these numbers? Uh, we've started generating it through instrumentation in the browser, in the wild. Uh, we have some JavaScript that, uh, using the CSS object model, grabs all of the style sheets that are on the page, uh, grabs a handful of them, and then tries to find um, DOM elements that match and then beacons that results back to a central location that we roll it up. Uh, this was also interesting for us because uh, in order to take advantage of the CSS object model, we had to serve all of our CSS off of origin and not off a uh, cookie-free domain. And that turned out to be, we, we tested that, of course, to make sure that we weren't introducing a huge performance penalty. We're only doing this for a small set of visitors anyway, but we still wanted to make sure that we weren't introducing an enormous performance penalty. And it kind of appears that the, um, the not having to connect, because CSS tends to be the first request to a cookie list domain, uh, but serving off of origin, we don't have to do the DNS lookup again. It was kind of a trade-off. So we, it was pretty safe to do performance-wise to perform this uh, analysis. And then we can uh, roll it up, aggregate it, and display to the user what we, what kind of confidence we have that this code is valid or invalid. And the formula is easy. It's just existing code in the code base, subtract out anything that we've seen in the wild, and anything that's left is suspect. And it's not 100% guaranteed that it's unused. Uh, if it was 100% guaranteed, I would just build a robot that would go around cleaning up unused CSS. Uh, so there's a challenge here, and the, there's, the challenges are both aggregating all this data in a way that makes sense, but also presenting it to the user in a way that describes the confidence that we have, and that confidence not being 100%. So it says, this is a place to look. It's not a guarantee. Go do the investigation, and, but to, like, to help, the, help developers and designers at Etsy have more confidence, but to also caution them that it's not a guarantee. So I think this is really fun. It's, using, it's bringing new instrumentation into the browsers that we hadn't seen before. Um, we've been using RUM and error logging in the browsers uh, to, to kind of introduce instrumentation. These browsers are powerful. They have a lot of interesting tools. And increasingly, the complexity of the apps that we're building is being pushed out into the clients as well. So it seemed only natural to start to improve the amount of instrumentation that we were gathering in the browsers to kind of consider it as one large distributed system uh, and to give ourselves the same sort of visibility and confidence into how code was operating out in the wild uh, as we had for, the same, for our um, servers within our network. So this has been a process of us uh, accommodating this shift towards continuous experimentation, uh, having to discover new tools and processes that we would need in order to continue to have good performance at Etsy in order to continue to be able to maintain these tools. And I, I would assert that this is one of the roles of a performance team or even you know, performance individuals, performance champions in an organization is to think about how you can get the performance results you need within the context of what the um, product teams uh, need and how the uh, team is operating. So uh, I... I'm happy to talk more about this after, after this talk. I also have office hours at 1.15, I think. So, um, and I'll take any questions now for as long as I have. So thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, okay, so the, yeah, I will repeat the question. The question was, do we, uh, do we check with our sellers before we run an experiment? Or like, yeah, do we, 
Do we let them know that they're in an experiment even? Yeah. So it turns out if you tell people that they're in an experiment, they will behave differently and will throw off the results of your experiment. So you, we can't really do that. We have recently uh, started doing some proactive messaging to sellers. Um, to, but it's, it's one of these things where it's like, hey, you might be in the experiment, and now that we told you that, we have to like, now, you're, now you don't participate in the experiment. You know, you have this knowledge now, but that means that you don't get to play. Your behavior doesn't affect the results. Yeah. The thing I actually was wondering is, like, essentially, the, the, an experiment could affect the conversion of a seller's product. Right. And what I meant is, like, on the seller side, they're posting something, and they're expecting something from you. Uh, do you have contracts written in such a way that, like, we're going to experiment on you, you can't help it? Or... Right. So, yeah, the, uh, to... Let me see, I'll see if I get it right this time. Uh, do we... Yes. Do we have contracts with the sellers that we will, say, uphold some amount of performance or... Uh, so, no, we, uh, it, is, it is actually a very difficult message to communicate. Uh, and we've done a lot of proactive messaging and there is a, a good amount of the community that now buys into experimentation as kind of a it's better across the board. You know, we will all in the end do better as we learn more things, as we uh, learn what is good and what is not, what is successful on Etsy. Um, but you, it's very common to see reactions from sellers to say, I don't want to be a part of this. You know, experiment on someone else. Uh, but it, yeah. We recognize it as being a positive force for uh, the entire community, uh, and it is on us to provide the best possible communication to the sellers to, to share that message with them. Uh, it definitely is somewhat controversial, though. Any other questions? Steve. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, so my I, I really like cleaning up craft, yeah. uh, and the tombstone idea is really cool. Um, my hypothesis about cleaning up crufty CSS is that that comes in waves or bulks, like you'll do a redesign and there'll be a bunch of CSS left over from the old design. Mm -hmm. In your experience, is it like a trickle thing, like there, it trickles constantly, or is it bursty? Um, yeah, so... I would say it's, uh, we, have, we have not seen a lot of it at all. I guess that's a, like it's it's a it's a goal, uh, but I would say like the tombstone uh, the talk about tombstone they talked about having days where they got everyone together to do some big cleanup and that sounds really exciting I think I'd love to do something like that uh, I think I'm gonna uh, maybe I'll answer a slightly different question but I would say one of the things that I was trying to avoid as uh, the role of, say, a performance team or an infrastructure team would be to put the onus on those teams to do the cleanup. You know, so there, there was definitely a scenario where we could have said the performance team is responsible for uh, making better performance, deleting CSS is going to give us better for performance, so the performance team is going to go delete all this on new CSS, and then six months later do the same thing, and six months later do the same thing. And that was the situation that we were really trying to avoid. So... Uh, like Lara was talking about in the keynote earlier, it's like trying to change the mindset, a uh, couple providing tools with changing mindset across the board to give people the tools to do the cleanup. So, clean, yeah, uh, trickle, I guess. <laughs> Go back to your question, yeah. Uh, see it here and there across the board, um, but I think perhaps the next step for us is to uh, maybe institute more process or kind of more more of an expectation about when it is time to do the cleanup yeah Yeah. So the question was for detecting unused rules using instrumentation, uh, how do you accommodate uh, dynamically inserted CSS rules? 
Uh, and that is like, that is exactly why you can't have 100% confidence in this tool, for example. Um, and the best we've got so far is that you look at the unused CSS rules and they all say colon hover, and you say, oh, well, maybe nobody's hovered on that. Uh, but, I mean, I guess you could say, uh, you know, what, things that we've thought about but have not yet implemented would be uh, running it more than once, you know, on a delay, on a loop. Uh, even that, I think, is not going to get you exactly what you want. And then, yeah, as far as dynamically, yeah, hard problem, totally. Any others? Yeah, hi. Oh, super grep. Oh, Splunk. That was Splunk. Yeah. Um, so, but y yeah, you could do, it's, you know, the, the magic that allows that, the correlation is really that we uh, have unique identifiers with every request that we insert into our access log lines, and we also embed that same unique identifier into the page so that we can use it if, if any JavaScript creates an exception uh, and we trap it and we send that message back to the servers, we send that unique identifier as well. So any, sort, yeah, any system you have that um, does log analysis, uh, the, the trick is just to have that unique identifier to be able to join it back up. Uh, yeah, that example was using Splunk, but I'm sure you could use other systems. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, have we ever had experiments uh, invalidate each other? And so the, the, okay, I might be answering a different question, but here's the answer that I would give would be, uh, usually we assume independence of tests. And that is a bit hand wavy, but it's kind of the only way to uh, sanely approach running multiple experiments at the same time. Uh, we have not done a lot to surface interaction effects but uh, we're looking at that now, actually. The, the analytics team at Etsy is uh, kind of hoping to build some tools that could surface analytic, uh, interaction effects. It's possible, we just haven't uh, done it so far. But so far, it's, uh, so we have this self-service tool, Catapult, that allows you to see results. But if you see uh, unexpected results in that, you can also uh, take advantage of our analytics team, and they, uh, if, you, if we see unexpected results, they, could, they would have that ability to kind of handcraft a response to that to say, yeah, it looks like there's an interaction effect. But uh, we haven't built that into the self-service stuff yet. How do you remember what experiments you've run? Uh, well, Catapult has all the whole list of all the experiments that have ever been run for the last three years. Um, so that still requires someone to have that, to go into there and see, uh, or to have some sort of institutional knowledge about what the experiments were. Um, but unless it's a real, so the other answer to that is that uh, unless it's a, unless it's a large effort to to do this new experiment, we tend to tr we tend to hope to make smallish experiments to validate small hypotheses and do them many times. Um, so it might be worth running it again, actually. Things might have changed over the last few years. You know, maybe the user base has changed, or maybe the technologies have changed. So it might not be so bad to run an experiment again, depending on how expensive it is. Yeah. Have you thought about open sourcing? Oh, I meant to say that. Catapult, I think, is a little too... It's too tightly integrated with our stack, but Ranger, the tool for navigating dependencies, uh, also tightly coupled to our stack, but we have goals to decouple it and release that as open source. Uh, I was talking with some folks from Airbnb, and they have an open source implementation of something that looks a lot like Catapult. So I think, th so there are tools open source to do experimentation, experimentation frameworks. Um, ours, I, I would be surprised if we ever were able to open source that. It's just too tightly bound to our Hadoop cluster, for example. Yeah. I can't see any hands, so if any, yeah, just shout it out. Yeah, go. How do you develop your 
Uh, how do you develop your hypotheses? Uh, so that's one, that's a great thing about being on the performance team is my hypothesis is always faster is better. This is real, that's pretty simple. Uh, for the other product managers who are uh, trying to make product decisions, yeah, that's the, that's the magic of being a good product manager, I think. Over there. Yeah, what are the tools we use to do analysis? Lots, actually. Yeah, there's a, we have a Vertica cluster for doing kind of business, uh, business intelligence roll-ups. A lot of data goes into the Vertica cluster. We have a huge Hadoop cluster, and we have a, kind of a scalding framework. Twitter released this scalding uh, framework, which is a Scala DSL over cascading to do MapReduce jobs. Uh, and so that is kind of the, like, um, the folks who are good with math can do that stuff. And then the catapult, catapult stuff is uh, rolled up over Hadoop. Um, it's kind of a general uh, Hadoop job. But um, let's see if I'm missing anything. Yeah, and that, well, I mean, there's also Splunk and the log analysis as well. I do, I do a good amount of analysis using that. I think that's maybe all of it. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anything? All right. Cool. Well, come find me after uh, office hours 115. And thanks so much. <laughs>